So the last part of proteins that we need to talk about is their structure. So we talked a little bit about it last video about how the amino acid sequence dictates what's going to happen, but there's actually four levels of protein structure that you need to know. So a whole separate video for that. Um, so first off, the primary structure of a protein is its sequence of amino acids. So this is actually what order the amino acids are in on the polypeptide. Um, and from there, there's secondary structure which is the interactions between these amino acids on a very small scale. And there's tertiary, which is interactions between um, the amino acids on a much bigger scale that result in folding. And then quaternary structure is actually more than one polypeptide together hanging out. So, so primary structure, like I said, it's a sequence of amino acids. So this is actually like the letters in a word. What is the order that the amino acids are in? And this is determined by your genetics. So your DNA codes for these amino acids. We'll talk about that a ton in a couple chapters, but for now, just know that this, com this sequence comes from your DNA, directly from your DNA. So this would be the primary, oh, the primary structure of an amino acid. So we have Gly, Pro, THR, GLY, THR, GLY. And here's our, here's our amino acid, look, we can see. The carbon attached to an amino group, attached to a carboxyl group, attached to an H, and attached to an R group. So we can see that they're simple primary structure, just what order are the amino acids in. Then we get into secondary structure, and this is how the, um, how the polypeptide backbone is interacting with itself. So any bonds that are happening at secondary structure is because of the repeating units in the polypeptide backbone. So this is the carbon, the amino, and the carboxyl. And there's two basic kinds of uh, protein structure, or secondary structure, or two basic trends that we see, which are called the um, alpha helix and the beta pleated sheet. So this is what an alpha helix looks like. Basically, these amino acids, the, um, the, peptide, the peptide backbone is bonding to itself in weird places. So what we have is, Um, a coil formed by H bonds between every fourth amino group. So between every fourth amino acid. So they're in a circle here, and then every fourth one is attached down the line. So it just causes this little spiral inside of the polypep inside of the peptide. So here we can see the spiral inside of a large, more largely folded molecule. So this is inside the backbone of the amino acid chain. And then over here we have what's called the beta pleated sheet just when a bunch of um, bunch of amino acid strains, a bunch of polypeptides, are in line next to each other, and then we see hydrogen bonds between the backbones. Um, and we can find these in both globular and fibrous proteins. And for example, the okay, so here's a better picture. So here's the alpha helix, just a spiral formed by these hydrogen bonds between. This looks like the uh, the carbon of one and the amino group of another, nitrogen of another. Um, and so there's a hydrogen bond between these two right there. And then on our beta pleated sheet, we see just these fold. It's just folded back and forth. And what it does is it gives um, it gives a lot of support to this protein. So these these bonds are relatively weak, but since they happen repeating over and over again, like one of these hydrogen bonds wouldn't do much. But since all of them are bonded like that, it gives it this shape. Same thing down here with these beta pleated sheets. There wouldn't be much happening here except for the fact that it happens over and over and over again. So for example, the, um, the strands of a spider's web contain a protein called trans, transthyretin, and this transthyretin is made up of many beta pleated sheets over and over and over again. And it gives it so much strength that this, a strand of spider's silk is actually stronger than a piece of steel at that diameter. So obviously most steel that you know is a much, has a much larger diameter than the width of a spider's web, but if they were the same width, this 
spider's web would have a stronger, would be stronger because of the beta pleated sheets that are found there. Then we get to tertiary structure. And tertiary structure now moves beyond the backbone of the polypeptide and into the actual R groups, the side chains of each amino acid and their interactions. So this no longer has to do with amino carbon uh, carboxyl. It's not that anymore. Instead, it's um, it's the side chains that are attached to the to the alpha carbon in the middle of the amino acid. And these interactions can be things such as hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, or hy hydrophobic interactions and van der Waals interactions. So do I have a picture of hydrophobic interactions? No, I don't. Okay, so hydrophobic interactions arise, and it's kind of actually an awkward term because it doesn't actually mean that, but what happens is hydrophobic interactions, the protein folds up and the hydrophilic polar sides are attached attracted to each other, but basically they shove all of the hydrophobic side chains into the middle of the protein. That way they don't have to interact with the water around the outside. So suddenly all of these hydrophobic sections are clustered in the middle and um, form a non-polar hydrophobic center. And so then the, the other side chains that are facing outward are the polar or charged ones that like to interact with the outside. Um, And so that's one kind, having all the um, hydrophobic interactions in the middle. These hydrophobic sections may be held together by slight van der Waals interactions, which are just really slight um, attractions to each other. But basically, they're all shoved to the middle. And then these guys are held in place by um, what's called disulfide bridges. So disulfide bridges are actually um, covalent bonds between different side chains of a polypeptide. So right here, we have to cysteine. So cysteine is an amino acid whose side chain is CH2SH right here. And so what happens is these two cysteines bond to each other because they're curved for whatever reason. And now we have um, a covalent bond between the two of them. And it holds it together really tightly. Um, so there's all these different kinds of bonds that contribute to tertiary structure. So there can be simple hydrogen bonds between this is an R group, this is an R group, and this OH is attracted to this O. Simple hydrogen bond. Or we can have these disulfide bridges, which are actually covalent bonds. Or if we have a negatively charged amino acid R group next to a positively charged amino acid R group, such as this kind, that would be an ionic bond, a strong force between two full charges. Then we also might have, here's these hydrophobic interactions. So CH3, CH3, these are all nonpolar because they're all carbon and hydrogen. So these are held together by hydrophobic interactions and van der Waals interactions. And then we get to quaternary structure, which is when we combine two or more um, polypeptides. So not all proteins have quaternary structure, but any large proteins tend to have quaternary structure. So we take these amine long, long, long polypeptide chains and they fold up um, through primary or through secondary and tertiary structure, and they form together with um, other polypeptides to be to encounter their quaternary structure. And so um, there's a bunch of different important kinds to note. So here we have collagen, which is an important molecule in our skin and um, important structural protein. And since it's a structural protein, it's a very long fibrous protein. And you can see each of these is a different polypeptide chain. So each of them individually, like you can see some alpha helixes inside all of them, then they are bound together and that's the quaternary structure of collagen, is the fact that there's more than one polypeptide coming together. Same thing with uh, hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is actually made of four different polypeptide chains and um, they're all globular, but they, they all come together through the same interactions. So there's four, there's two alpha subunits and two beta subunits. This is what it looks like. And then these are main constituent in red blood cells. They're what carry oxygen in your blood. So that's what that picture is for. Um, okay, so it's really easy to kind of imagine how a change in quaternary structure could affect the function of a protein because if the polypeptides are not holding together correctly, it's going to be hard for them to do their job. But it's actually just as um, likely that a change in primary structure would cause a problem with the folding of the protein. And an example of this is sickle cell disease. So sickle cell disease comes from a one amino acid change in the sequence of the polypeptide. 
So here we can see this is a normal hemoglobin. So sickle cell comes from that protein hemoglobin, which carries your blood, it's in your red blood cells. Here, a normal hemoglobin has glucine at, or glut glutamic acid. And number six, down here in the um, sickle cell hemoglobin, it's been substituted for valine. And so what happens then is this beta subunit cannot hold correctly anymore because of this substituted amino acid. And now it has an exposed hydrophobic re region which when we get to quaternary structure causes all these problems. The molecule looks totally different than this one. And then rather than um, the molecules being independent of each other, floating around and not socializing with each other, down here in sickle cell, these hydrophobic regions now cling to each other because they don't want to be exposed to the outside of the cell. And so now they cling together and form these long chains and cause the amino acid to... Oh no. <laughs> cause the um, hemoglobin to totally fold up. And then what happens is it um, sticks to each other inside of, your, inside of your bloodstreams and you can't really get oxygen very well. So that is a problem. And it comes from one single amino acid change. So you can see it, that's what it looks like. Um, so what actually determines protein structure, what can affect this is something your book talks about. So physical, so in addition to primary structure, because primary structure dictates what side groups are on them, which obviously control tertiary and then quaternary structure, but also physical and chemical conditions can affect structure. So changes in pH, salt concentration, temperature, or other environmental factors can cause a protein to unravel. And so basically, if you heat something up, then the proteins are just going to fall apart because think about it, all those hydrogen bonds are just done. They're not there anymore. Um, and so this process is called denaturation, when a protein loses its structure. And it's going to lose its function because, remember, its structure is directly related to its function. The lock and key model, if we destroy the lock, the key's not going to be able to do anything anymore. It's not going to be able to fit anymore. And so these become biologically inactive. They can't do their jobs anymore. So this is a normally folded protein. And over here, this one is completely denatured. So in some cases, if you put a chemical into a solution with proteins and it denatures it, as soon as you remove the chemical, it may be able to return to its normal conformation. However, um, sometimes things with changes in pH or high changes in temperature, you can't return to how it used to be, which is why having an especially high fever for a really long time can be dangerous because then your proteins become denatured. They can't do their jobs anymore, which is really important. So lastly, your textbook talks about um, predicting the folding of proteins and how scientists haven't quite figured it out yet. Um, so it's pretty challenging to figure it out. We can't figure it out from its primary structure. And we can't always figure out how it got there from its final structure, from its quaternary structure, because uh, oftentimes as the protein's being formed, it goes through several different changes to get to its final conformation. But we do know that um, there's these molecules called chaperonins. And these, protein, these are proteins which help other proteins fold. So here we have um, an image of a chaperonin. And so basically, it's this cylinder, which has a hollow space in the middle and a cap on top of it. So the cap remo is removed, and then the unfolded polypeptide, so it has primary structure but nothing more. The primary structure polypeptide goes into the cylinder, and then it says the cap attaches, causing the cylinder to change shape in such a way that it creates a hydrophilic environment for the folding of the peptide. So it suddenly becomes very hydrophilic, probably very polar inside there, and leads to all these hydrogen bonds and covalent bonds and ionic bonds to form. And then when it's done, the protein is correctly folded, and it leaves as the cap comes off, and then we have our finalized protein.